you know, the green beans, the collard greens, the, uh, the mac and cheese, you know. Soul food, from sweet potatoes to dressing to cornbread. Traditional Thanksgiving dishes in the black community aren't just delicious, there's a historical connection. Soul food really was food that white people were throwing away from their tables to their scraps. And in the ingenuity of black people, we found to make that taste good, to be nutritious and grow our children from. Lamont Collins of the Roots 101 African American Museum says dating back to slavery in times of oppression and struggle, food has always been a safe space in black culture. It was our big mamas, our aunties, our sisters that were putting those recipes together at the table before slavery and after slavery. So food has always been part of our culture. After just one bite of soul food, you'll understand why many look forward to Thanksgiving every year. So what we do tastes good, feels good, and we walk good after we get through eating it. How's that? Colin says this Thanksgiving is the most significant in his lifetime. With an ongoing pandemic and racial unrest, the holiday is a reminder of the black community's strength. So Thanksgiving is just another way to be at the dinner table to look at, look at each other and be grateful through the struggles and through the strife we have continued to survive. And while enjoying soul food, celebrating togetherness and being thankful, Colin says to remember the backbones of our families this Thanksgiving. You know, elderlies matter in our community, grandmothers matter, grandfathers matter, and not be able to hug them and kiss them at this point in time it's really a double whammy for the black community. So everyone to stay grateful, prayerful, and thankful for the time we have on this earth. Alexis Matthews, WLKY News. Happy Thanksgiving, America. I'm Donna, and I'm here with my friends to tell you the real history behind this holiday. Growing up, I knew that what they told you in school about Thanksgiving wasn't true. That's not the true story. The true story behind Thanksgiving was after every killing of a whole village, these European settlers celebrated it and they called it Thanksgiving. But it wasn't until Abraham Lincoln became president that it became an official holiday. He ordered 38 Dakota men to be hung for war crimes after the sacred holiday Christmas. We take this time to remember our elders who lost their lives due to what really happened. Usually my mom makes a Native American dish for us and we pray. Growing up I would be kind of annoyed that they didn't know what actually happened on Thanksgiving and that they're actually celebrating the deaths of many people and many tribes that were lost. Whether it's to give thanks or to be with your family, you should learn how the holiday was established in the first place. I'm thankful for being born indigenous to this continent. I'm thankful that I still have my culture. I'm thankful that my elders kept our culture alive all these years. I'm thankful to be indigenous, resilient, and alive. I'm thankful for us all to be able to stand together, stand strong, and stand this one. Happy Thanksgiving, America. Happy Sabbath, everyone. This is Darnell Gabriel from Revolutionary Sword. Peace and blessings from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I am here to present another Sabbath lesson, another great video, and some great uh, information to share with you concerning uh, these uh, <laughs> pagan holidays, right? Uh, but I just want to tell you, uh, don't get mad at me. I'm just a messenger. And I'm only sharing with you what I've learned in my journey with God, okay? And I pray that the God of Israel, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, will open up your eyes to this truth. And this truth will set you free according to John 8.32. Now, I've, I've really been enjoying, enjoying sharing this, this, uh, these uh, videos and the information that you know the Lord has allowed me to you know gather up throughout the years and I'm presenting it to you now I had made a decision for me and my household just like Joshua said for his household we shall serve the Lord now many of you all that follow Christian traditions you know 
uh, this might be a little foreign to you, but that's okay. Because at one time it was foreign to me. But then once God put that light on that dark area based off of what we've been practicing throughout the years, then I made a decision and I decided to abandon ship of all those, you know, traditions that we enjoy so much, whether it be Christmas, whether it be uh, Halloween, whether it be uh, Thanksgiving, birthdays, uh, Easter, Mother Day, Father Day, we abandoned all those holidays. But right now, I'm just going to, you know, dive into the uh, this holiday which is coming up uh, I believe this coming Thursday which is Thanksgiving and you know I know all of you all are you know gathering your resources together get ready to buy all those nice uh, turkey and hams and chitterlings and uh, candy yams and whatever else that you're going to present on that day and sitting down with your family and, and enjoying a nice meal and maybe even Maybe even sitting back watching you know a football game or something and some some nice conversation but I just want you to understand that you know I, I know the position that you're in and I understand the mindset but I'm just explaining to you based off of what I learned and based off of my research that God is not involved in any of these holidays and that's why I'm presenting the information to you so you can, you know, go look into it yourself and make a sound decision. Now, I, I want to believe with all my heart that everybody that's listening under the sound of my voice want to want to love God, want to honor God, you know, with all their heart, soul and strength. But if you allow tradition to get in the way of your relationship with God, then that means that you got a problem with God. You understand? So, uh, I'm not going to, I'm going to try to keep this video under an hour now, you know, because I got quite a bit of information I want to share and I know I'm not going to be able to do it in no 30 minute span. So I just want you to sit back and relax and, uh, just let me, uh, you know, pour this, this knowledge on you <laughs> in Jesus name. All right. Now, the first thing I want to do is I'm going to talk to you about, you know, you know, the history of Thanksgiving. And if you look at my title, it's going to be called uh, Happy Slaughter Day, right? Happy Slaughter Day. And I know that might sound kind of harsh to say, but it's actually true. And there are many, many, you know, books out there that, you know, actually testify that this was uh, basically a slaughtering okay it was a slaughtering of the indigenous people of this land to take over this land 
and to prosper from this land. Not for those people benefit, but for the benefit of the people that came uh, and colonized this land. Okay, so that's what we're going to, you know, talk about now. But before I get, you know, deep into the information part, I just want to read a few scriptures to you to help you understand God's uh, mindset towards people that, how can I say, by conniving, sneaky, uh, planning and trickery to take somebody else's stuff, right? And even to the point of breaking covenants, right? God has a very, very strong hatred towards that. Well, I mean, it's obvious because God is a God of truth. God is a God of love. God, God ain't even going to step on your toes if you don't want him to. It's just that you got to understand that there's going to be consequences of rejecting his word. Okay. Now, I want to take you first to Micah chapter 2. And I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. And I'm using these verses to help you to understand and to establish a case against the people that actually came over here and, and uh, colonized this land. Okay. And you know who I'm talking about, right? <laughs> now, Micah chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, Woe to them that devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds when the morning is light they practice it because it is in the power of their hand verse 2 says and they covet fields and take them by violence and houses and take them away so they oppress a man and his house even a man and his heritage now that is a very very profound uh statement and verses to help establish my position when it comes to not celebrating thanksgiving and also i want to give you some scriptures to support I can't read them all but I'm just going to give you some scriptures to help you understand the level of depthness that God has uh, towards people that act in this manner okay you can go read Psalms chapter 7 uh, 14 through 16 Psalms chapter 7 14 through 16 you can also go read Psalms 140 1 through 5 Psalms 140 1 through 5 and also go read Proverbs 6 chapter 6 12 through 16 Proverbs 6 that's chapter 6, 12 through 15. Now, and there's many, many more scriptures, but that's enough to help you to understand that God ha really has a problem with people, even so much to he, he says, woe to them, right? That devise iniquity and work evil upon their beds. And that's Micah chapter 2 verse 1 and 2 now also uh, you all might not be familiar with uh, this verse of scripture that I'm getting ready to read to you but I'm going to read something to you from the book of Ecclesiasticus alright let me get that for you right quick I thought I had it pulled up already Ecclesiasticus Okay Here we go Okay 
Ecclesiasticus chapter let's see 33 okay here we go and I'm going to read to you 7 through 9 chapter 33 let's see 7 through 9 okay now, now listen to this it says why do one day excel another when as all the light of every day in the year is of the sun by the knowledge of the Lord they were distinguished and he altered seasons and feasts okay now just to kind of help you to understand it is God that set up, you know, days, times, and seasons, right? But if you didn't know, along with these days, times, and season, God set up his own holidays. And those holidays that I'm speaking of is Passover, Unleavened Bread, uh, Pentecost, uh, feast of trumpets atonement and tabernacles these are God's holy days but then you get people out here that do not want to celebrate or follow God's holy days but listen to this let me keep going okay it says by the knowledge of the Lord they were distinguished and he altered the season and feast. Some of them he had made high days and hollowed them. And some of them he made ordinary days. And all men are from the ground and Adam was created of the earth. Okay. Now here you get these verses of scripture establishing that God is the the creator and he is the one that created a certain order and he's expecting for mankind to follow this order but then why do don't you have men follow this order it's because there are certain groups of men that do not want to follow God's order so they change times they change laws they change seasons and they change holidays that is the point that I'm making and that's according to what this is saying in here now if you go look at Leviticus chapter 23 verse 1 it will explain to you that God established his feast days or his holy days or his holidays for mankind to celebrate but instead mankind want to follow what mankind has established to be a day of celebration okay now if you go to Proverbs 30 let me go there right quick Proverbs here we go chapter 30 And I'm going to go to verse 6. And it says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Add not to whose word? God's word. Lest he reprove you, and you be found a liar. Now, when is that going to happen? That's going to happen when the Lord Jesus Christ come back. Everything that you think he's going to be okay with, you're going to find out that he's not okay with it. And if you don't switch your mindset now, then when that time comes, if you are still here on this earth, then you're going to be reproved and you're going to be found a liar. Now you're going to say, wait a minute. I didn't establish all this. I was born into it. Well, that don't matter if somebody already told you. 
if somebody already told you that God ain't with it, then guess what? That ain't gonna matter to God because the truth was already given to you. All right. Let me go to James chapter four. James chapter four. Here we go. Chapter four. And I'm going to just read verse four. It says, ye adulterers and adulteresses, ye know that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now that's very, very harsh and strong words coming from brother James. Matter of fact, James is the brother of Jesus. And James is what you call the bishop of the apostolic church after Jesus had left. Okay? Now, the thing is, if you're not going to listen to the apostle James and also being the brother of Jesus, then, you know, of course, you're not going to listen to me. You might even come up with an excuse and say, well, you can interpret that however you choose to interpret it. No, no, no. If you if you follow the pattern of scriptures, then you will come to understand James's mindset and all these things he has learned from his elder brother, Jesus the Christ. OK, so that's the foundation of what I want to build off on when it comes to about celebrating uh, any of these holidays but this particular holiday holiday we're talking about is Thanksgiving all right now let me move on from there now and I'm looking at my notes <laughs> okay so the title of this video is happy slaughter day happy slaughter day why am I saying that because that's basically what happened to the indigenous people of this land they got slaughtered they got slaughtered and they got their land taken from them okay you all you might say well all is fair and love and war okay that might be so with your earthly mindset but in God's mindset just based off of what I read what what uh, goes around comes around okay now now, if you're not uh, familiar with this, this is something that I might I have talked about in, in you know previous videos throughout the years uh, pertaining to uh, the Gadites and uh, the other tribes of Israel pertaining to the northern tribe, particularly of Israel that got scattered. And uh, I believe with all my heart that the native uh, indigenous people of this land which I found out in my uh, uh, family family tree that I'm a part of that that uh, legacy right and the bottom line is I believe that the northern tribes of Israel that got scattered all over the world some of them quite a bit of them landed over here in North America and these uh, what you call say Caribbean islands or even uh, South America so on and so forth but it's so much history and it's so much to you know focus on I can't focus on everything but what I am going to focus on is one particular tribe and that's the tribe of Gad okay and I believe that the tribe of Gad is part of that native indigenous group of people that was over here in the Americas before the Europeans uh, made their way over here. Now from my understanding, uh, not just uh, the Israelites made it over here, but also the African tribes made it over here. And I'm speaking more so to the Phoenician people, which is a, uh, a Hamitic tribe that did uh, commerce or trade 
around the world in that region in that day and time and we talking about these people did a lot of traveling uh, abroad on the seas right and so a lot of them made it over here I mean there's all types of artifacts and you know uh, earth mounds that prove that hermetic people as well as Shemitic people made their way over here to the Americas long long time ago and has been living uh, uh, their life here for uh, millenniums before the Caucasian or European people made made their way over here now from my understanding the Vikings even came over here even before Columbus okay and those were the first set of group of white people or Caucasian people that has set foot on this land but the bottom line is you got hermetic people as well as Shemitic people that has been living here for millenniums right and uh, if you know anything about the history of these people they were they are very spiritual people very spiritual minded people and they have rules they have regulations they have laws that they follow and that don't mean that you know you, every group of people have some conniving uh, uh, deceiving um, practices in their uh, lineage but overall the groups of people that was over here had their own laws had their own constitutions so when Europeans came over here they they didn't civilize these people these people were already civilized and matter of fact you're going to come to uh, find out in some of the history that I'm about to read that the indigenous people of this land helped civilize them oh yeah okay so but what I want to do is is read to you a little bit concerning the tribe of Gad who I actually believe is a part of those indigenous people that has been here for millenniums now I'm going to take you to uh, Genesis chapter 30 Genesis chapter 30 and we're gonna learn a little bit about Gad Genesis chapter 30 okay hold on one second Genesis chapter 30 here we go all right and I'm going to read just one verse and that's verse 11 now in Genesis chapter 30 is if you go to the top of the chapter we got uh, let me just read verse 1 to you it says and when Rachel saw that she bare Jacob no children Rachel envied her sister and said unto Jacob give me children or else I die <laughs> now, that's pretty that's pretty interesting that a woman to feel that that strongly about having children but that was a part of the culture getting married having children having a family having a legacy that's a part of building a lineage building a nation and building a culture of people right because it was a shame for a woman to not be able to have children in those days right that's why you hear Rachel saying give me children lest I die okay because she became envious of her sister okay and if I jump down to verse 11 now her sister's name is uh, Leah now I, I don't have time to go on to explain you know the interaction of uh, Leah and Rachel and Jacob and how they came together but you know uh, basically uh, Jacob was deceived by his father-in-law and he ended up marrying Leah but he really wanted Rachel right but then God helped Jacob 
you know, uh, get out of that contract, and he ended up having both of them. But the problem is that uh, Rachel just so happened to be barren, just like uh, Abraham's wife, Sarah. But God, you know, worked a miracle out, and she was able to have children after a while. But let me read verse 11. It says, And Leah said, A troop cometh, and she called his name Gad. Now, Leah is the one that had uh, Gad. Rachel is the one that produced uh, Israel. Okay? Now, Gad is a, a part of another group of people when I, well, let me take that back Israel is Jacob Let me just pause that for one second Israel is Jacob But what I'm saying is All of them are part of the tribes of Jacob Or Israel But it was Leah that produced Some of the tribes of Israel That's what I wanted to say Now Leah just so happened to have a uh, child whose name is Gad. Now, Gad, by definition, means troop. It means good fortune, right? Or fortune. So, Gad means troop. And when I go into the etymology of it, it means to invade and attack now, I want you to keep that in mind because these are the signs
attack. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because these are the, some of the things that's going to come out in the history. It means to evade or gad means to invade or attack, overcome, invade with troops. So basically, Gad, in his own spiritual DNA, he's a troop. And when he attacks, they attack as a troop, as a group of people, like a gang. That's how Gad operate, okay? Now, Gad also means to penetrate, cut, attack, and invade. This is something that God put down in Gad. Gad is a warrior. Gad penetrates. Gad attacks. Gad invades. Okay? Now, I'm going back to the verse. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of information about Gad. Alright. Now, now that we know that it's Leah who had one of the uh, tribes that come from the loins of Jacob who is Israel one of the tribes is called Gad now there are other tribes that came from out of uh, the loins of Jacob and they make up the ten tribes of Israel which became a part of the northern kingdom of Israel okay now I'm going to take you to Genesis 49 Genesis 49 and I want to show you something there Genesis 49 and I'm going to read to you 18 through 20 so let me go down to verse 18 it says I have waited for thy salvation O Lord Gad a troop shall overcome him but he shall overcome at the last now what does that mean based off of what I have researched and what I have learned this is a prophecy and when you go to the top of the chapter Israel is actually about to pass away he's about to cross over uh, and you know leave his children but before he's leave he leaves them he's going to give them a blessing and he's going to prophesy to them okay so he's basically prophesying to each one of the tribes of Israel and there are 12 of them because he had 12 sons okay but in verse 19 it says Gad a troop remember Gad means troop shall overcome him but he shall overcome at the last what does that mean that means that Gad is going to be overcame by another troop or Sitting Bull requested this council. We await his words. Take your soldiers out of here. They scare the game away. Very well, sir. Tell me then, how far away should I take my men? You must take them out of our lands. What precisely are your lands? These are the lands where my people lived before you whites first came. I don't understand. We whites were not your first enemies. Why don't you demand back the land in Minnesota where the Chippewa and others forced you from years before? The Black Hills are a sacred land given to my people by Wachantonka. How very convenient to cloak your claims in spiritualism. And what would you say to the Mormons and others who believe that their God has given to them Indian lands in the West? I would say they should listen to Wachantonka. No matter what your legends say, you didn't sprout from the plains like the spring grasses, and you didn't coalesce out of the ether. You came out of the Minnesota woodlands, armed to the teeth, 
and set upon your fellow man. You massacred the Kiowa, the Omaha, the Ponca, the Oto, and the Pawnee without mercy. And yet you claim the Black Hills as a private preserve bequeathed to you by the Great Spirit. And who gave us the guns and powder to kill our enemies? And who traded weapons to the Chippewa and others who drove us from our home? Chief Sitting Bull, the proposition that you were a peaceable people before the appearance of the white man is the most fanciful legend of all. You were killing each other for hundreds of moons before the first white stepped foot on this continent. You conquered those tribes, lusting for their game and their lands, just as we have now conquered you for no less noble a cause. This is your story of my people. This is the truth, not legend. Or another group of people. But at the end, Gad is going to overcome them. Okay? You follow me? All right. So, also... I want to read something to you from Deuteronomy 33 and 17, verses 17 through 23. Let me go there right quick. Deuteronomy 33. And I'm going to jump down to verse 17. And it says, His glory is like the firstling of his bullock. And his horns are like the horns of a unicorn. With them he shall push the people together to the ends of the earth, and they and they are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. These are other groups of the ten tribes. You got Ephraim and Manasseh, which actually makes up the ten tribes of Israel. Okay? Now, verse 18 says, And of Zebulun, he said, Rejoice, Zebulun, in thy going out, and Issachar, in thy tents. These are other tribes of Israel. And they shall call the people unto the mountain there they shall offer sacrifices of righteousness for they shall suck of the abundance of the seas and of the treasures hid in the sand these are some things that you need to keep in mind because from my understanding when those group of people made it over here they was living off the fat of the land Prior to the arrival of the Europeans, the Cherokee lived in villages along the major rivers. There'd be 100 to 600 people in a typical village. They were an agricultural people. They farmed corns and beans and squash. They also supplemented the farming with hunting deer and elk, gathering wild foods, fishing. But agriculture was the basis of their society. Their typical house arrangement would be a round winter house that they'd live in in the cold months and then a rectangular summer house was more open-sided, pretty much keep the rain off, and you'd have two or three small outbuildings for storage. Their way of life was radically changed after the Europeans arrived. Between the slave raids, the war fighting, and especially the diseases, it's estimated the Cherokee lost two-thirds of their population in 20, 25 years. They actually made out better than most tribes. For American Indians as a whole, it's estimated that 90 to 95 percent of the population was wiped out in 100 years. When you lose two-thirds of your population, it radically changes your society. You're probably losing your political leaders, your elders, your healers, a lot of people who know what plants to eat. Land. Really changed and there was abundance of that. riches over here. So I want you to keep that in mind. Verse 20 says, And of Gad, he said, Blessed be he that enlargeth Gad, he dwelleth as a lion, and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. Now, it seems to me that Gad seems to be more like a leader type tribe. Because it says, 
And of Gad, he said, blessed be he that enlargeth. Enlargeth what? Territory. So it seems to me that Gad is the one that enlargeth, of course, by the blessing of God, his territory. But also, he dwelleth as a lion. That, that means that Gad is a fierce warrior. Okay? He's like a lion. Also, it says, and teareth the arm with the crown of the head. Not only is he a fierce warrior, but let me give you a de the definition, the crown of the head. It is a head or a crown of head, top of the head, a hairy crown or scalp. Now, I want you to keep that in mind because we're going to see... Uh, not only in some pictures, but some videos that's going to demonstrate that Gad wore a crown on top of his head. And not only did Gad wore a crown on, on top of his head, he ruled the land like, like a king. Okay? Now, what I want to do is go back to the verse and read verse 21. And he provided the first part for himself because therein a portion of the lawgiver was he seated and he came with the heads of the people. He executed the justice of the Lord and his judgments with Israel. So Gad not only uh, seemed to be a lead tribe, but he also was a lawgiver. He also uh, was seated with the heads of the people. And he also executed justice of the Lord. Okay? So these are things that I need you to keep in mind, especially as we dig a little bit deeper into uh, quote unquote Thanksgiving. Okay? Now, I want to take you from there and I want to go to another book that you might not be familiar with but uh, I'm going to read something to you from a book called Second Esdras Second Esdras uh, chapter 13 and I'm going to read I can't read all of it but I'm going to read uh, a few verses to you but Second Ezra, chapter ten, I mean chapter thirteen, four, uh, forty through fifty. Second Ezra, chapter thirteen, forty through fifty, and it's talking about the ten tribes of Israel that was taken away into captivity in the time of Hoshea, King Shalmaneser of Assyria. So. They was taken into captivity by the king of Assyria and captured them and deported them to a foreign land east of the Euphrates River. Okay, so that would be like over there in the area of Iraq and Iran. Okay, but it also says, but the ten tribes decided not to stay in the land among many Gentiles. Of course, that's over east. Okay. So they move further east to a country where no human beings had ever lived before. This is something that you need to keep in mind. Verse 42 says, There they hope to keep their laws. What laws? God's law. Which, which they had failed to keep in their own country because Israel uh, failed to obey God. That's what made them go into captivity in the first place. When they had made a, the difficult passage across the Euphrates rivers over east, God Most High performed miracles for them and blocked the channels of, of the river until they had crossed over. Their long journey through the region, which is named Asherah, took a year and a half, and they have lived there ever since. Now, in these last days they are coming back home and once and once again God most high will block the channels of, of the river so that 
they may cross over that is the meaning of the great crowd of people excuse me the great crowd of peace loving people you saw now this is something that is very uh, uh, awesome to me to read because when you talk about the history of Thanksgiving I mean you think about okay the Europeans came over there they couldn't take care of themselves so the indigenous people of the land helped them and pretty much saved their life right taught them how to plant seeds and you know uh, deal with the harsh weathers that's over here in the Americas especially if you are a person that lives in regions where it gets very cold or a lot of snow you know it can be very difficult so you can only imagine how it was back then in those times but notice that the ten tribes traveled uh, across the Euphrates rivers and God worked a miracle for them to keep going and they traveled so far it took like a year and a half and they came to a place called Arsereth now Arsereth I believe means a uh, unknown land uh, uh, uninhabited land you know don't quote me on that definition but that's something I think I, I did actually read and came across some time back but they ended up coming to a place that was unknown or uninhabited by other groups of people now I can't give you a specific date date on that maybe that's something that I can look up and then I can come back eventually and, and present that date to you but that was a long long time ago okay based off of this it was after they came out of the Assyrian captivity uh, and I want to say uh, roughly between 600 and something BC let's just put it like that so that's a long time ago okay now I want to keep moving uh, now I want to go to first Chronicles first Chronicles here we go first Chronicles chapter 5 and the reason why I need to give you these you know uh, scripture information is to help you to hear what the scripture have to say about these these people and then once we dig into the history you start to connect the dots okay now in first Chronicles chapter 5 I'm jumping down to verse 17 and I'm going to read 17 through 19. It says, All these were reckoned by genealogy in the days of Joachim, king of Judah, and in the days of Jehoram, king of Israel. Verse 18. The sons of Reuben and the Gadites and half the tribes of Manasseh of valiant men men able to bear buckler and sword and to shoot with bow and skillful in war where four and forty thousand seven hundred and three score that went out to the war now these are descendants of Jacob and these descendants are Rube, uh, sons of Reuben and the Gadites and half of the tribes of Manasseh and the scripture says that they are valued men very skilled in bearing buckler and, and shield and shooting a bow you know a bow and arrow and it as you can see it was a whole troop of them it says 44,000 Seven hundred three score that went out to war. Verse nineteen says, "Excuse me." Yes, verse nineteen says, "And they made war with the Hagarites and Jetor and Nephish and Nodab." Okay, so now we understand the scripture testify that. The tribes, the ten tribes of Israel are fierce warriors. Now, 
I'm going to go to first. Oh, oh no! <laughs> They want us out in the open. Someone get up the hill! No, nobody move! Just stay where you are! Oh yeah, they want the pelts. We gotta get on that boat right now. We're gonna lose it all. Now I'm going to go to First Chronicles 12. First Chronicles 12. Okay. Here we go. And I'm going to jump down and just read one verse. Verse 8. It says, And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David into the whole to the wilderness men of might men of war fit for the battle that they could handle shield and buckler whose face whose faces are like the faces of lions and were as swift as the rows upon the mountain rows are like uh, what you call like uh, deers antelopes you know you know how swift they move so but they the scripture described their faces as faces of lions
So that means that they were really fierce looking and they were fit for battle. They can handle shield, buckler, and they seem to be one of the lead tribes or what you call like King David's three men 300 like in the in the movie 300 it's like they that's their that's their uh lead warring tribe okay that was able to go to war on the behalf of the tribe of Israel okay now now I want to go and read something to you from the Smith Smithsonian uh, magazine you know and Smithsonian got a magazine and I think it's called the Smithsonian Museum but they also got a magazine and guess what they give you a little bit of history about Thanksgiving right that's what I'm going to read to you now the Smith the Smithsonian uh, magazine actually gives you what you call a nice nice uh history lesson <laughs> on the history of thanksgiving okay so now what i want to do is go to the top and i'm just going to read uh the first two paragraphs so you'll get a little context it says in thanksgiving uh pageants held at schools across the United States, children done headdress colored with craft store feathers and share tables with classmates wearing black construction paper hats. It is a tradition that pulls on a history passed down through the generations of what happened in Plymouth. Local, local Native Americans welcome the courageous pioneering pilgrims to a celeb celebratory feast but as David Silverman writes in his new book this land is their land the Wak Wakapon Indian Plymouth Colony and the troubled history of Thanksgiving so they finna give you a dark side of Thanksgiving that's basically what this this uh, article is about it says much of that story is a myth riddled with historical inaccuracies the, the first thanksgiving started in england with the pilgrims the pilgrims was a bunch of people who wear bell buckles on their head they came to america because they wanted to go to a church but the king of england wouldn't let them We've had it with your religious persecution, King James. What are you going to do about it? We're going to America where we can practice our religion freely. Whatever. They went on a big ship called the Mayflower and went to America. What do you think they did when they were on their boat? Played dominoes or something. Or chess. It took the Pilgrims a really long time to get to, the, to America, but they finally got to America in 1620. How long do you think it took them to cross the ocean? Eight days. Four months. 100 days. But when they got there, they were out of food and it was snowing. Did you bring blankets? No. Me neither. <sighs> we should have had a plan before we came here. I think I have hypothemia. The Native Americans Help the pilgrims get to the cold. Hello, Englishman. I am Squatto. Perhaps we should strike a treaty between our peoples. Good idea. Here's some, here, this is maize. No, that's corn. They show the pilgrims how to grow crops. How to hunt. And how to dance. What else do you think they taught them? Uh, girl stuff, like flowers. How to learn rice by singles. And how to shop, I think. They didn't teach him how to fish. The Pilgrims was really happy now that they wasn't dying anymore. They decided to have a big party to thank 
the Native of the American. They even invited Chief Massasoit, the leader of the tribe. Welcome to our banquet, Chief Massasoit. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving. That's what we're calling it. Cool. I bet there'll never be problems between the Englishmen and the Native Americans ever again. They had turkey, fruits and vegetables, deer, and pumpkin pie. You know, they actually didn't have pumpkin pie at the first Thanksgiving. What? The feast was a shining example of our spirit. That's why we still celebrate Thanksgiving. I'm hungry. Beyond that, Silverman argues that the telling and retelling of these falsehoods is deeply harmful to the Wakapanog Indian who lives and society were forever damaged after the English arrived in Plymouth. So he said to take the so-called nice picture of Thanksgiving and continually pass that down as something that is uh, actually a real thing is very damaging to the uh, indigenous people and it, they're called the Wapanog Indians okay Wapanog Indians and some of you all might have some of that lineage in your uh, background okay but it says when the English people came over here that history was very damaging to them and to and to take it so lightly uh, that's something that they have to keep on their conscience every time this uh, celebration or so-called celebration circle back around it says it says Silverman's book focuses on the Walker Penogs or Walk Penogs I want to make sure I'm pronouncing their name right when the pilgrims landed at Plymouth in 1620 the Sackham chief Osequin offered the new arrivals an entree preliminary or primarily as a way to protect the Wapakanals against their rivals as excuse me against their rivals the Nasakaret for the for 50 years the alliance was tested by colonial land expansion or colonial land expansion. I want to make sure I'm saying these words right. Okay. For 50 years, the alliance was tested by colonial land expansion. Okay. Now, Silverman goes on to explain that there was some kind of uh, agreement in 1620 between the uh, Walpanogs and the Europeans that came over here and the Walpanogs saw them as being can be used as allies to help protect the Walpanog people from other rival Indian or indigenous people in that in that land okay but it goes on to say it says then tensions ignited into war known as King Philip's War or the Great Nasarek War, the conflict devastated the Wapanals and forever shifted the balance of power in favor of European rivals. The Wapanals today remember the pilgrims' entry to their land as a day of deep mourning rather than a moment of giving thanks. We hope you can assist us, Opuchankano, to find the child that was taken. I cannot control every man from every village. <laughs> I'm only a king. If I can discover news for you of where the child might be, what will you give to us? We know the king loves English goods. Now I wish the man, my manatoic, winkatawak, the shantas, my machiash. Nakata, ta, my moon. No way, wish the man. We wish for knowledge of the English. Are we the shuntas, nekich, bewak? How many more will come? 
I promise you, we do not know this. Kakuasheu as makta na wewistaman. No, no. Ta mamon. Ta shuntas masherewak. We know many English promises. Kakuashe wachaman. Kwak mas kakapong kwai. But they vanish like smoke. We are here to reclaim a child. And this is how you treat us. Sorry, Takatara Chahama. Na te rakaman in kerantak. Machamanan. Our people go among the English, never to return. Coach, Pocahontas. Coach, Wanich An. Yach, a kamunk, Yapan. You stole Pocahontas from us, and her child remains beyond the sea. This is not peace. This is not kindness. Yo maktai kuini, yo makta wamanasawang. You see my face. Now is Naskinsa. I will take counsel. I will speak with the Sharrows. And if that child is not returned, then we will be back, ready to fight. I mean, thanks. Because in in trade of you know having them as allies the Wampanoags was making deals with them of uh, buying land but that became you know a, a very um bad decision so bad that it became a a detrimental position position for the Wampanoag people okay now i'm going down a little bit further and I want to read something to you from what is the myth Thanksgiving myth what is the Thanksgiving myth it says the myth is that the friendly Indians unidentified by tribe welcome the pilgrims to America teach them how to live in this new place sit down to dinner with them and then disappear they had they hand off America to white people so they can create a great nation dedicated to liberty, opportunity, and Christianity for the rest of the world to profit. That's the story. It is about native people conceding colonialism. It is a it is bloodless and in many ways an extension of the ideology of manifest destiny. And this goes on to say, which I'm going down a little bit further. How did the great dinner become the focal point of the modern Thanksgiving day? For, for quite a long time, English people have been celebrating Thanksgiving that didn't involve feasting. They involved fasting and prayer and supplication to God. In 1769, a group of pilgrims, descendants who lived in Plymouth, felt like their culture authority was slipping away as New England became less relevant within the colonies. And the early republic and wanted to boost tourism. So they started to plant the seeds of this idea that the pilgrims were the fathers of America. Actually, after many months at sea, Griffin Peterson and his shipmates finally reached the new world. I declare this land Cohorn. This place is nothing but a wilderness. What are we gonna do? We're gonna build a new settlement. We'll have a happy new life and we'll have equal rights for all. Except blacks, Asians, Hispanics, Jews, gays, women, Muslims, um, everybody who's not a white man. And I mean white, white, so no Italians, no Polish, just people from Ireland, England, and Scotland. But only certain parts of Scotland and Ireland. Just full-blooded whites. No, you know what? Not even whites. Nobody gets any rights. <sighs> America. Okay, the pilgrims were the fathers of America. Now, excuse me one second. I think my light went out. Want to make sure I got plenty of light. Okay, there we go. All right. So, it seemed to me that 
they're saying that the pilgrims felt like their culture authority was slipping away from them so they came up with a bright idea to uh, attract tourism and to boost it by saying that the pilgrims were the fathers of America okay now I want to go down a little bit further and I want to talk about the part where it says uh, can you explain the discrepancy in English and Wap Wapanaw conceptions of property it goes on to say it is incorrect as it is widely assumed that the native people had no sense of property they didn't have private property but they had community property and they certainly understood they certainly understood where their people's land started and where it ended and so when the Europeans come to the Americas and they buy land from the Wapanals the Wapanals essentially assume the English are buying into Wapanal country so in the Wapanals mind they just taking a little plots of land and not trying to take over the land you understand what I'm saying he goes on to say the Wapanals initially assumed that the English are buying into Wapanal country not that they were buying Wapanal country out from under their feet it says imagine flotilla of Wapanal canoes crosses the Atlantic and goes to England and then Wapanals buy land from the English there has the has that land now excuse me my computer is jumping has that land now passed out of the jurisdiction of the England of England and become the Wapanals of course not that's ridiculous so the Wapanals are not thinking like okay you can buy some land from us you just you know becoming a, a part of our culture and that's okay but the Wapanals did not have a mindset of thinking that these people was actually trying to totally take over their country let me go Washichuki Ahina Makiyublu Umakocheki Ihangiapi Anheta Makablo Eche Okaptapelo Since the white man came and broke up the grassland with his plows, the earth has turned to dust. Makabalo Kile El Tashonka Witko. In this dust there is the body a crazy horse. Milahanska Tashonke. American horse. Ena. Sintegaleshka. Spotted tail. Ena. Chega Sapa. Black kettle. Ena. Milawaka. Sword. Ena. Oinumpa. Two moons. Ito Magaju. Rain in the face. Makabo blue chana. When the wind blows. Chaji we chun yata piki. Ite awo umblu pelo. Blows our heroes in our faces. Ogalaka. Unkitawa piki. Our diplomats. Ena. Our doctors. Ena. Pejuta wechashaki. Our priests. Ena. O kaeja. Unkitawa pi ea. Pik on hena. Our dead children. Maka. O blue. The great spirit speaks to us in clouds of dust. Leelo Machocheki Yoshpushpu Uyo Preya Pi. You cannot sell Oyake Pishnialo pieces of the earth. Echehe Wakantanka Tawayalo. Because the earth belongs to God. Oyate Kilena. We must tell these people to go home back to Washington and not hurt the earth anymore.
막거치에끼 해체가라 안나 안나 우리 정 오피 깨달로 나콘 레체가라 게 We will give no more of our land away. Nakko. Not even this much. Let me go a little bit further down. Now it says, did all Wampanoags want to enter into alliance with the English? From the very beginning, the sizable number of Wampanoags disagreed with the Osseguin decision to reach out to the English and try to undermine the alliance. The Osseguin puts down multiple plots to wipe out the colony and unseat him. Some Wampanoags say, let make let's make an alliance with the Nesagrets. These are Indians tribe. Not sure if I'm pronouncing their name right. And get rid of the English. These English. So they got a mindset to get rid of the English, and not all the Wampanoags wanted to be in partnership with the English like that because they didn't trust them. Listen to what it says. They've been raiding our coast for decades, enslaving our people, carrying them off to unknown face, and they can't be trusted. So, Not quickly. Henry, there's more of them behind us. Trapped here. These people know me as a conjurer. You said as much yourself, Master Sharon. Can you, between you, carry the doctor and move at speed down to the river? I will walk towards them as the sorcerer who mystifies them. As I have their full attention, you must move swiftly. Sir, they will kill you. Call to them. Tell them the conjurer comes to put them under his spell. The shantas mamontam peomechi. Peta wa monito wa. Ah, peta. Wa neto. Wa neto. Mirakuyak, Ritam Puzuakan, Renapawak!
so this is what they come to the conclusion about the English speaking people that they can't be trusted. Some Wampanoags believe that they caused epidemics and there were prophecies that this would be the end of the people. So according to what some of the Wampanoags felt about the English speaking people is that they can't be trusted and they also said that there were prophecies that this would bring our people to an end. Now can you imagine that? Prophecies. Well, we just got through reading some prophecies, right? <laughs> now, I'm going to take you out of the Smithsonian uh, magazine, and I'm going to take you to a actual indigenous uh, article. And it's Patu, patawatami.org. Patawatami.org. That's P O T. A W A T O M I dot org. P O T A W A T O M I dot org. And I'm just going to read a little bit of this article, and it's basically talking about, you know, the experience that the indigenous people had with these Europeans. And, and the disease that they brought with them when they came over here. Listen to this. It says, prior to the European arrival, America's indigenous did not experience illness attributed to livestock, overcrowding, or poor hygiene. The, the indigenous people never experienced illness attributed to to livestock, overcrowding, or poor hygiene. Now, that's something to think about. And that's something to say. It says, residents of Northern Europe and England rarely bathed, believing it unhealthy, and rarely removed all their clothing at one time, believing it immodest. Lorraine wrote, in lies my teacher told me, the pilgrims smell bad to the Indians. Squanto tried without success to teach them to bathe according to Fanny Zinger, his biographer. Isn't that something? So Squanto literally tried to teach these pilgrims to bathe. Now, that's amazing to me that uh, throughout the history of Europeans, even up to this very moment in time, that they had uh, bad hygiene problems. Now, there are histories pertaining to the Moors, how the Moors had to go into Europe and help, you know, teach them about hygiene, so on and so forth. And there's a lot of things that the Greeks had to learn from the Egyptians when they invaded that region now there's a group of people that if you go look up the history called the Scythians the Scythians were warlike people and they had hygiene problems <laughs> so this seems to be a trait amongst European Caucasian people all right I didn't write this stuff this is part of history okay it says within three years the plague wiped out between 90 to 96 percent of the inhabitants of coastal New England. Native societies were devastated. Only the 20th person in scarce left alive, wrote Robert Cushman, an English eyewitness, re recording a death rate unknown in all previous human experience. Lauren wrote. Okay. You may have heard that Native Americans were killed by smallpox, but here's the sinister part. We have evidence of Europeans plotting to infect them. I found this information on the website called The Straight Dope. You can see the links in the video description. Here's the actual communication. You're looking at a picture of the letter where they conspired to use germ warfare in order to exterminate Native Americans.
They uncovered these letters where they actually plot biological warfare in order to exterminate Native Americans. Amherst first raised the possibility of giving the Indians infected blankets in a letter to Colonel Henry Bouquet, who would lead reinforcements to Fort Pitt. Bouquet discussed the matter in a postscript to a letter to Amherst on July 13, 1763. Here's a smoking gun. P.S. I would try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets that may fall in their hands, taking care, however, not to get the disease myself. As it is a pity to oppose good men against them, I wish we could make use of this Spaniard's method and hunt them with English dogs, supported by rangers and some light horse, who I think would effectively extirpate or remove that vermin. Extirpate, exterminate, by giving them disease. On July 16th, Amherst replied, also in a postscript, P.S. You will do well to try to inoculate the Indians by means of blankets, as well as to try every other method that can serve to extirpate this execrable race. I should be very glad your scheme for hunting them down with dogs could take effect, but England is at too great a distance to think of that at the present. On July 26th, Bouquet wrote back, I received yesterday Your Excellency's letters of 16th with your enclosures. The signal for Indian messengers and all of your directions will be observed. Excrepating, which means exterminating, Native Americans. This video is part two of a video criticizing Jesse Waters for mocking the idea that Europeans exterminated Native Americans. Let, let me get this straight, Bob. America's founding fathers that came over here, colonized America, made it the great land that we are today. You're saying they exterminated a whole race Jesse, of Jesse, you must have been educated You don't in really believe that, you do you? He was incredulously saying, the Founding Fathers did this? Yeah, well, you can read Thomas Jefferson's own words where he talks about exterminating Native Americans. If we are constrained to lift the hatchet against any tribe, we will never lay it down until that tribe is exterminated or driven beyond the Mississippi. Thomas Jefferson to Secretary of War General Henry Dearborn, August 28, 1807. They have seduced the greater part of the tribes within our neighborhood to take up the hatchet against us and the cruel massacres they have committed on the women and children of our frontiers, taken by surprise, will oblige us now to pursue them to extermination or drive them to new seats beyond our reach. Thomas Jefferson led it to Alexander von Humboldt in 1813. I'll have more to say about Jesse Waters in part one. When that's available, it will be right here. Until then, here's two good videos, one about drones and one about, again about drones, but how NBC suppresses a key part of the protest against these drones. Okay, so I'm gonna stop right there. I'm, I'm well, I'm a little bit over an hour, but that's fine. But uh, in this video, I'm going to leave uh, some video movie clips that you can look at, and it's going to span the amount of time of this video. But based off of what I read and what I share from you from the Bible, as well as some of the historical information, you should be able to connect the dots along with the actual uh, movies that display some of this history so my thing is is this when you sit down with your family at this table and enjoy all this great delicious meal and the festivities of fellowshipping with your family keep in mind that this day was established based off of the slaughtering of your people and these people are my people and from my understanding, the people that was here are God's children, the children of Israel, the, the 10 lost tribes or the 10 tribes that got scattered. And a lot of them ended up here in the Americas. So that's just something I want you to keep in mind. Okay, this is Darnell Gabriel from Revolutionary Sword. I bet, I'll see you on the next uh, video, on the next Sabbath, and I bid you shalom.